this uh, session I will uh, talk about some uh, technologies from Microsoft and uh, I'm very happy to bring you together a lot of new technologies. Uh, first, I would like to know how many of you are familiar with C-sharp language. Great. Um, uh, and uh, another question, how many of you are connecting Microsoft with uh, Windows uh, OS? Okay, for you I have great news. <laughs> it's not Windows anymore. Actually, it's cross-platform. Finally, we can compare with Java, right? Okay. Let's talk about a little about why .NET Core. .NET Core is rewritten from scratch. It's not .NET Classic anymore. Actually, I can extrapolate and tell Microsoft it's somehow rewritten from scratch, starting with Satya Sacha Nadella, which is the last CEO. And uh, two years ago, Scott Hunter, when uh, he presented .NET Core as new technology from uh, Microsoft, he said the new vision is any developer, any app, any platform. And we will focus on any platform because .NET Core is finally cross-platform. What that means? That means we can now write our code anywhere and run on any platform. That's, uh, of course, Windows with uh, all other versions, for example, Windows 10 IoT Core for IoT devices. I will explain a little bit later. Then it's a lot of Linux distributions, and finally it's Mac OS. <coughs> but now let's focus a little on the hardware, on the reason why this is so important, and maybe why it takes uh, it took so long. X86 and X64 are the CPUs uh, which you have in your uh, laptops, device, uh, laptops, servers, and desktops. But as well, we have ARM CPUs in our smartphones, in uh, devices, in tablets. And uh, they are very, very different because, for example, X64 has complex instructions taking more cycles to run. In the same time, ARM CPUs use reduced instructions once per cycle, and for that, some parallelism is needed there. Therefore, many more registers are needed. So having these hardware differences you can figure out is not an easy thing to port an operating system from X86 to uh, ARM CPUs. But why Internet of Things? Well, uh, in my opinion, the Internet of Things is the next revolution, comparable with the smartphones or maybe electricity, because a lot of devices will uh, invade our world. For example, Microsoft is, uh, is investing $5 billion in IoT for the next four years. And I'm pretty sure it's not investing in some stuff like, like this mouse, right? It's a Microsoft mouse. We have for IoT a lot of devices, but now we will focus on Raspberry Pi. Why is that? Because it's very cheap. And uh, Raspberry Pi started as a cheap solution for poor countries to build cheaper PCs, but ended up like an IoT device with pretty good performance. For example, uh, an hour ago, I just um, read about another um, Raspberry Pi 3, named Raspberry Pi 3 A+, which is even cheaper and uh, smaller, smaller factor, and uh, as well with the ARM V8, which is good for .NET Core. I'm telling you that because the little brother of Raspberry Pi, for example, Raspberry Pi Zero, 
it's not fit for .NET Core. It's uh, ARM v6, and uh, for using .NET Core, you need at least ARM v7. But anyway, we have ARM v8 here. And let's see the variety of operating systems built uh, which supports Raspberry Pi device. But the, of course, we have the official operating systems, uh, operating system, um, it's Raspbian. Actually, Raspbian, it's a Debian distribution for um, Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is not only a small PC, it has an extension for connecting sensors. It's a, an extension with 40 pins, and these pins are digital. So uh, if you are familiar with, with the Arduino, Arduino, it's not a PC, it's an, a supercontroller, and it's competitive. It has digital and analog signals, but for Raspberry Pi, you have digital signals only. So to work with the analog signals, you have to use some extensions or to use some special pins. I will, we will not get in these details, uh, details here, but we'll talk ab about sensors. We need, we want to give to our machines some senses. For that, we need sensors. A lot of sensor categories are available. And uh, why is this very good uh, to do that now? Why is the time for IoT now? It's because the price, the size, and consumption has decreased. And for this reason, the sale, the precision, and features are in, is increasing. So now it's the time to, so actually now we can afford to put a sensor on some disposable box. It's so cheap. As I told you, we need to, get, to give senses to our machines. For example, vision, taste, pressure, um, localization, communication, other senses as well. And for my demo later, you can uh, watch it uh, at the workshop session. I will uh, see you explain uh, in details how I have used this kind of sensors. It's a variety of sensors. I'm using analog sensors and a digital sensor as well, and some LEDs for feedback. For example, I'm using luminosity, temperature, and uh, distance sensor. These sensors are not expensive. Actually, they are very cheap. Some of them are not calibrated. That means the values are not connected with some um, measurement system, like meters or degrees. And some of them are calibrated. So they are um, giving exact values for this uh, uh, measurement system. But as I told you, Raspberry Pi is not using digital, is not using analog uh, signals. For that, we need some adapter. And for that, we can use uh, MCP3008, uh, which is an integrated circuit. And um, I'm using analog digital converter as a shield for my Raspberry Pi. For what? Just for uh, converting the analog signals to digital signals, right? I will skip this uh, part with the code, but I will uh, talk more on a workshop session later. So let's go and see some uh, action. I have connected to the Raspberry Pi using my phone as a router. So now it's a local network between my laptop and uh, Raspberry Pi. I want to mention here we don't need internet. It's all on-premise. Okay, 
and I will start the application which I built for this demo, which is in fact a web service. I'm waiting a little, now it's online. And for that, I will go to, the, to this, this IP to get uh, access to the sensors. We have to wait a little because I did not optimize the application for Raspberry Pi, which has poor uh, network connection, but it's uh, working. And let's put this application in day mode. Day mode means I'm reading the values from sensors, doing nothing. For example, luminosity, it's 70%. It's, the sensor is not calibrated, so I have uh, converted the value on, a, on my scale. But the temperature, it's pretty real. And the sensor, it's showing zero because if it's the distance is too big, um, it will say uh, zero. But you can estimate now it's about 20 centimeters. <laughs> it's not precise because the opening, it's only 15 degrees. So uh, it's not a personal uh, uh, detector. It's, uh, it needs a narrow uh, um, spot, right? But anyway, it works. So uh, let's see, uh, for example, right now, the sensor values are registered in a SQL database on uh, the Raspberry Pi. I'm storing these values for later use. And uh, let me show you, for example, the temperature, getting these values in real time. OK, I said real time, but how is that? Because uh, the application, a web application, it's not prepared to push the notification in real time if you are not using some web sockets, for example. Uh, and now I will uh, switch back to the presentation to tell you about what technology I have used to keep pushing the values from server in real time. For a modern application, we cannot uh, imagine, for example, Facebook without having uh, real-time communication, without all the notifications, um, for example, the news feed or messages, right? So I'm using for my application SignalR, which is not new, by the way. You had SignalR uh, on .NET Framework Classic, but for uh, .NET Framework Core, for .NET Core, it was rewritten, and now it's working over the TCP IP. What that means? That means now we are not dependent on web. You can talk with the different kind of technologies, console applications, mobile applications, um, Java clients without making any trick. It's uh, on TCP IP. Uh, instead, uh, SignalR, it was built on uh, HTTP. I mean the SignalR.NET Classic, right? OK. Let's see, not the code, because I'm keeping this for workshop session. Let's see back the application. Um, when uh, we see these values, but you know, the temperature, I, yeah, well, actually, I can uh, change something. I have the lighter here. Pretty hot, right? Well, uh, I can use the, the flashlight as well, but I keep this for later. And 
let's talk about something else which I found very useful more for my application. The machine learning. And why is that? When I played with these sensors, I had the feeling something is missing because for every session which I uh, use for presenting this demo, the environment conditions uh, was different. Why? Because the, the lights are not the same. Because the temperature is not the same. And uh, just figure out, if you are building an application for production, you have to make some tweaks. You have to make a, an algorithm first. And then, for using that environment, maybe in summertime, maybe in wintertime, maybe in open, outdoor, indoor, you have to make some tweaks in order to have uh, good predictions, for example, right? But um, I found very useful to use for that machine learning because that's somehow automatic, right? You have to train your model for maybe two minutes and voila, you have this uh, in production anywhere. But having some IT guy tweaking the algorithm for your needs is not cool. Let's get to it, into some details about machine learning and the traditional way of programming, as you already maybe know, actually you are knowing this, uh, it's having input values, some formula, that's the algorithm, the logic of your application, and getting some output values. But for my problem, that's not good, as I explained before. For my problem, I have input values and some output values. So I plan to teach my application what kind of state I have in front of my sensors and the application to decide what would be the best algorithm. So uh, for uh, machine learning, it's having input and output values, guessing a formula, and with some other new values, to, out, to get some output values as well, but this time you don't have to know the algorithm. Algorithm is a, a magic, right? What I'm using for my application, it's a, a supervised learning because I'm training my model, telling to my application, okay, now I'm showing you some demo values and that I would like to show you some uh, uh, lighter values, and then flashlight, and we'll do them that uh, in a minute. And after that, I'm making some classification. For this, I need some specific algorithm from machine learning, but anyway, it's not me who's writing the algorithm. I'm uh, telling the application what kind of learning I need. I want to tell you something interesting. It's, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a machine learning specialist. I'm uh, working with web applications, but just figure out it's easy to uh, adapt some machine learnings from the beginning in an empirical way but later you can get to know more uh, kind of uh, problems and uh, uh, which uh, machine learning types better fits your needs. You can get into the details later, but for now this uh, machine learning uh, type, it's helping me and it's work, it works, it's good. Okay, let's go back to the demo. I will restart my application because I need some new data. OK. 
okay? A few more seconds. And I will keep my application in day mode. The application is uh, reading sensor values twice a second. So uh, as you can uh, see or figure out, we don't need too many values for this uh, um, application. Actually, it's enough to have maybe 10 or 15 readings, and it's good for us to uh, estimate. Now I will stop this mode, and I will switch on lighter mode. I wait a little because I, I need some more values. Okay, we can stop. And now I will go with the, some cold light, right? Like my uh, phone. And let's put the application in flashlight mode. Let's read some values. Okay, I think it's enough. And let's simulate night mode. I will uh, put a finger on my luminosity sensor. My finger is pretty transparent, but doesn't matter. Good, now we have values. Let's read the values from the database in Raspberry Pi. You can see here the values. Day mode, lighter, flashlight, and night. And I will get these values and open another application which works on my laptop. Usually, it's not the Raspberry Pi where you want to make predictions. The Raspberry Pi should focus on gathering data. But I will... Uh, start the other application, which is connected. OK, let's drop the data there. I have here some new data. Let's save this file and run. Let's notice here this application. It's connecting. To the, other, to the other application using SignalR web sockets. Let me put this, put this side by side. Yes, we have now this side by side. And let's click this button, which tells to my application to trade the model with, with the values which I brought from the Raspberry Pi. Of course, this is day mode. I would ask, where's my flashlight? Here. Someone to help me. Can you? Please. But please, don't ruin my <laughs> two, in, uh, two centimeters uh, here, it's fine. Go closer, closer. Good, thank you. And now, try this one. No, no, please, help me. It's more important. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. So what I have done here, <laughs> what I have done here, it was not me writing the algorithm because it's not reliable. It's the machine learning which is using all the data gathered from sensors and making some simple predictions. And uh, I would like to ask you how many of you know the code name for C sharp language was cool. Cool, yeah. Cool from C like object oriented language. Cool. It was about 17 years ago, officially, even more, about 19 years ago when uh, C, C sharp language was uh, in work. And uh, after so many years, we can tell again. .NET Core is cool. If you have any questions now, please shoot. Otherwise, we can talk and get into some more details with code this time uh, in the work, work, uh, workshop session. If not, thank you.